When my wife and I first fell in love, we tried to do something that would signify that, as many of us do. You buy a little car that you have together or something that you can share together. And that kind of symbolizes it for you. Uh, we bought a dog, a little boxer puppy. <clears throat> and at that time, I was a, a, a minister, a Methodist minister, in what we call in Ireland a city mission. A city mission is in the center of a large city and deals especially with the problems of the inner city, particularly the economic problems in the slums. And so we had uh, uh, various holiday homes to which we took uh, the little children who really never got a vacation in the summertime. And uh, we would visit those homes and help to administer them and uh, help to get to know the uh, little guys and girls. And I remember uh, one day we went and we took the little, we called him Rebel because he looked, little boxers look as if they'd fight you, you know. And he was still a puppy and we took him to this uh, home where all the little children, maybe from six-year-old to maybe ten-year-olds. And uh, uh, we had a meeting, of course, and singing and all that kind of thing. And then afterwards it was kind of a free-for-all. And uh, uh, at that point in the evening, uh, I suddenly was aware that there were a lot of uh, calls and yells from the little children. And uh, I looked over, and Rebel, of course, loved to lick you. And he loved to lick faces. And to him, it was just wonderful if he could get more than one face to li lick. <laughs> and at that point, all the 20 or 30 little kids were lying down on the floor, face up, and yelling, Lick me, Rebel, lick me! <laughs> And he was, of course, wearing out his tongue and licking. <laughs> and when you have that kind of a scene, you really do feel there is something beautiful in life, don't you? You feel, oh, there is something that is delightful, and there's something innocent in life, and there's something wonderful in life. And I think you've seen the same kind of thing. If a little four-year-old guy decides to play with his new puppy and uh, decides to play ball, you know, and they start going after the ball, and then after a couple of minutes, of course, they're rolling over on the floor, and the little guy's giggling like mad, and the little dog's licking his face, and the ball's lying in the corner. And that kind of scene makes you feel that there is something beautiful and something innocent in life and there is a dear spirit in life that is, is beautiful. That's all you can say about it. You know, you feel it on a summer morning. You go outside and the birds are swooping down over the surface of the lake and the fish are jumping and the water is rippling and glittering like gold in the sunshine. And you suddenly begin to feel this is beautiful. There's just something magnificent about life that is overwhelming. And really, you're exactly right. That is something real. You know, you almost feel there's a tangible spirit of joy in the world. That's, you can almost touch it. It almost seems as if it's bursting out. And that's really what it is, loved ones. It's God, our dear Father, smiling at His Son, Jesus. That's it. And smiling at all of us who are made of His Spirit. And it's His Spirit that is communicating that to us. And that's why you and I feel at times something rising inside us, don't we? We feel there's something inside us that is rising to that. You feel, yeah, I, I'm like that myself. And that's because the same spirit that is making the little kids giggle or making the little dog run back and forward or making the little child giggle, it's because the same spirit that makes him do those things, same spirit that makes the bird swoop down over the lake, same spirit that fills the whole world with that seeming liberty is the spirit that is in you and that has made you. And that's why you feel a rising inside yourself to that. Oh, there's a, 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 an English poet called Wordsworth. Some of you may have heard of him. 
and he didn't know fully to what extent that spirit was connected up with Jesus, but he spent a lot of time in the Lake District in England. And uh, he would sit there looking at the kind of picture that we've described at a lakeside, and then he said, and I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. And I think you've felt that, haven't you? You've felt certain moments in your own life when what you saw on the outside in the world itself seemed to be continuous with what you felt on the inside. You've come to a certain spring morning and you've got up and you've gone out and you've felt that the beauty and the cleanness of the spring morning is continuing right inside you and is inside you. And like the uh, guy on the commercial on television, you know, you're not only clean, but you feel clean and you smell clean. <laughs> and it's just such a good feeling. It's just so good. It just feels, yeah, this is the way it was meant to be. And then, away at the other end of the spectrum, you've been aware of a different spirit. The kind that seems to fill the atmosphere when the divorce case is actually being tried. And the husband and the wife are sitting on opposite sides of the court. And it seems that each minute that passes, even the very room gets darker and narrower. And the bitter criticism drags out every little fault, every little error that they ever made to each other. And it magnifies it. And it seems to look back over all their life and it drags out things that were absolutely innocent, little looks and little actions that were innocent, but it reads unfaithfulness and hatred and criticism and tearing down the other person into them. And then you know the pettiness and the meanness of the spirit seems to take over completely when it comes to the division of the property and the possessions. And that spirit of pettiness and greed seems to grab at this clock or this ornament or this car or this house. And you're suddenly aware of a whole different spirit, a spirit that is narrow and petty and mean and dark and has none of the beauty and the brightness of the other spirit. And isn't it true, loved ones, that that's the spirit that we touch when we touch murderous thoughts or we touch petty thoughts or we touch selfish thoughts. And the strange thing is there's something in us, isn't there, that actually would rise to that because there seems some of that in us too and yet somehow the better part of us actually is repulsed by that and seems to sense that it's wrong and that it's the generous, beautiful spirit that is most real to us and most basic to us. Loved ones, that's the kind of situation that is real in our world. The first spirit is one of grace. And its source is love. And its basis is mercy and forgiveness. And its character is generosity and freedom and liberty. 
And that's the spirit of our maker. And it's the spirit that originally made you and me. And it's the spirit that is most basic to you and me. It's the spirit that is described in that psalm, you remember, that that Joel read. God does not deal with us according to our sins and does not requite us according to our iniquities. And he showed me a couple of nights ago that he does not deal with us either according to our mistakes or requite us according to our, our errors. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. And that's the spirit that made us. That's the spirit that is most basic to us. That's the spirit that is generous and free. And loved ones, if that is the very spirit of Jesus himself. Because you notice that he didn't call it an it. He didn't call the spirit an it. After he came to earth, he called it a him because he knew that it was he himself coming back to walk the earth. And wherever he walked, he would bring that freedom and that liberty. And of course, if you want to have that spirit in your own life, then you first need to have a trust. That is a trust that God's love and generosity and big-heartedness is powerful enough to work all things according to the counsel of his will so that you won't have to fight in the gutter for what is rightfully yours. That's the first thing that's needed. See, it's no good. It's no good if he has all that attitude in his heart, but he can't do anything about it. Then all you say, well, is that would be nice, Lord. It would be nice if your spirit ruled the world. But that's no use unless he actually has omnipotent power that will enable him to work all things according to the counsel of his will, whatever happens in your life and whatever people do to you. And so in order to be filled with that spirit yourself, rather than a spirit of fear or a spirit of pettiness or a spirit of legalism, you need to trust first that God has not only love in his heart, but he has omnipotent power by which he can work all things according to the counsel of his will so that you are not required and do not need to get down in the gutter and fight for what is rightfully yours. God will look after that. If you will take care that his spirit of love and beauty is the one that governs your life. And the second step, of course, that you need for that spirit to fill your life, he outlines, if you like to look at it, in John 14. John chapter 14. And verse 15, it's page 939. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. That's it. You need to trust God that he has power to protect you and guard you and to work things according to the counsel of his will, whatever is happening to you. And then you have to obey him. Do what he tells you to do. And Jesus has assured us that he will give us his spirit and fill our lives with his spirit. Now, loved ones, the part of us that rises to the spirit of fun in the little giggling guy or the little licking dog, or the swooping birds, or the springtime air. The part of us that rises to that is our conscience. That's what rises to that inside you. 
And the part of us that is repelled by the pettiness and the meanness that takes place in the atmosphere of the divorce court, that's our conscience. So I want to tell you a secret. Your conscience does not attest to what is right or wrong or what is good or evil. It doesn't. Your conscience doesn't attest to what is right or wrong or what is good or evil. Actually, your mind does most of that. Your mind stores up all kinds of standards and all kinds of ideas of what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. And it's usually your mind that attests to that. Your conscience attests to what will enable the sweet, fragrant spirit of Jesus to fill your life or what will enable the petty, legalistic, grabbing spirit of Satan to fill your life. That's it. That's what your conscience attests to. It attests to whether the fragrant spirit of Jesus will fill your life as a result of this action or this attitude, or whether the evil, stagnant spirit of Satan will fill your life with self and pettiness. In other words, your conscience actually attests to life or death. It doesn't attest, first of all, to right or wrong. It attests to what will bring life and the liberty of God and the beauty of his life to you, or what will bring the evil and the ugliness of Satan to you. That's why we should obey the governing authorities. Let me show you, loved ones. Because there's something beautiful in obeying the authorities. It doesn't have to be kind of dead and dry. It's something beautiful. Romans 13 and 5. Romans 13 and 5. It's page 987. 987. Romans 13 and 5. Therefore, one must be subject not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. That's why we should vote. That's why we should observe the speed limit. That's why we should observe the spirit of democracy as well as the letter of democracy. Because only by obeying God's direction to us there are we obeying him because the authorities are really representing him in this issue. And he says, obey the authorities. Not just to keep yourself out of trouble. Not just to avoid my wrath. My wrath is to limit the excesses of the evil spirit of Satan. I want you to obey the authorities so that I will be able to fill you with my spirit of liberty and joy and love and life. In other words, your conscience attests to where there's oil. Your conscience attests to where there's oil. Where there's the oil of the Holy Spirit. And your conscience always attests to where you're facing dry wells, where there's maybe rightness and wrongness, and you're exactly right and the other people are exactly wrong, but there's dryness, there's no oil, there's no oil of the Holy Spirit. Your life becomes petty even in winning your case. So the conscience attests to where there's oil. And that's what he's doing in this verse. He's saying, don't get all wrapped up in disobeying the authorities. For goodness sake, obey them. That's the least you have to do. Obey them. Live well above the law because I have a million wonderful things to give you in the spirit of life that I possess and I can only give that spirit to those who obey me. How does that apply, loved ones, to some of the controversies that many of us see between church and state? Well, I'll show you the verse that I think throws light on it. It's 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 23. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 23. It's page 998. 998. 
1 Corinthians 10 and 23. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Maybe it's lawful to lobby, even to lobby aggressively, as the bankers seem to have done. Maybe you didn't bankers, but you seem to have done. Maybe it's lawful to lobby as enthusiastically as they have done. Maybe it's lawful to lobby as enthusiastically as the pro-life supporters have done and do. Maybe it is. Maybe it's perfectly lawful. Maybe it's lawful to lobby as we believe the insurance companies are about to do. Maybe it's lawful. But is it helpful? Does it build up in you the spirit of beauty that fills those things that we talked about at the beginning? Does it build up in you the spirit of God's generosity and magnanimity? Or is it possible to win a case and lose the life of God's spirit in your heart? Is it possible to win an argument and lose a soul? Or is it possible to lose an argument and win a soul. Maybe it's possible to both win a case and maintain the flow of God's Spirit in your life. But you see, the all-important issue, loved ones, for we, for us who are God's children, is the flow of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. Not the winning of a case, not the winning of a political struggle, because somebody else will have to struggle for it 20 years down the line. But the important thing for us is the continuing of the flow of God's Spirit in our lives and the flow of His Spirit in our hearts. So this applies to your life and mine. Some of the things that we fight for in personal financial issues in people who charge us wrongly with certain things, in business situations where we know we're in the right, some of those cases we'd be better to dump and forget and trust that the mighty God who loves us is able to work all things according to the counsel of his will. Sometimes we should just dump those things. Sometimes we should deal with them the same way we have to deal with petty criticism from our friends or resentment from somebody else who works with us. We'd be far better to forget it, to overlook it, not to deal with them according to their sins, not to requite them according to their iniquities, but as far as the east is from the west, to put their transgressions far from us and to look up to the Father and say, Lord, I receive your dear spirit into me because though all things are lawful, not all things build up. And that's one of the biggest reasons for obeying those who are in authority over us and not getting ourselves entangled with the fringes of the law. We're meant to live well above the law because obedience has to be a whole spirit of belief and trust in God and obedience to any slight commandment that he has given us in his word. And so we're meant to live not along the rough edges of the law, not along those ragged edges where maybe this is right and maybe it's wrong, but we're meant to live well in the center. We're meant to obey the authorities over us, not from fear of God's wrath. God's wrath is to restrain the excesses of the spirit of Satan and selfishness. It's not to bring about this flow of God's holy, clean spirit in us. We're meant to obey those in authority over us for the sake of conscience that attests to where there is spirit of God and where there is spirit of meanness and selfishness. Uh, those of you who are sailors will, will, will know the saying. Somebody has said, the ocean is perfectly safe. 
It's the hard stuff at the edges that get you into trouble. And every sailor knows that. It's far easier when you're out there with plenty of sea room around you, you're safe. It's when you're coming into port or when you're coming close to the rocks, that's where you're sweated out. And loved ones, the Father is saying to us, stay well away from the hard edges. Stay well away from running it close. Your salvation is not in the law anyway. So I want you to submit to those in authority over you, not just for the sake of my wrath, not just to avoid being fined or avoid getting into trouble, but because of conscience, because your conscience attests to the sweet, fragrant spirit in your heart or the selfish, petty spirit getting hold of you. In other words, it's not just linguistic coincidence that we talk about grace on the one side and law on the other. It's not just linguistic coincidence. It's actually true. Your life is either filled with a spirit of grace, a spirit of generosity and magnanimity that overlooks others' faults, and that trusts God to bring about his will in your life and in the will of this nation in the life of this nation. It's either a spirit of grace or it's a spirit of legalism and law that gets hold of your heart and shrinks it more and more the more you pursue that method. So, loved ones, don't let the iron of the law ever get into your heart. And you understand, I'm not now just talking about submission to those in authority over us. I'm talking about those situations where you feel you were in the right I was in the right. I was. In that accident, I was in the right. In this argument with my boss, I was in the right. Loved ones, if you let the iron of the law get into your heart, you'll find yourself being filled with that spirit of selfishness and pettiness and evil and satanic power that we talked about in connection with the divorce court. And there's only one way to be filled with the spirit of God's beauty and fragrance that is basic to your heart and mine, and that is to trust him that he can overrule in all things and work all things according to the counsel of his will and then to obey him without question. So that while people say, you're stupid obeying, you have every right to do this, you say, yeah, but I go not according to right and wrong, not according to good or evil. I go to the boss inside. I go to my conscience. He attests what will bring the fragrant spirit of Jesus into my life and what will fill it with the spirit of Satan. So I pray, you know, that you'll, you'll start living like that. Loved ones, I, it'll cl- clean you out. It will. I, and it'll enable you to live above the world. It will. Let us pray.